For those of you who don't know me, my name is David Leatherbarrow. I'm a visitor here from uh, States at the University of Pennsylvania. And the first thing I wanted to say is uh, how appreciative I am of this event. In my part of the world, it's not common for academics or people researching and writing to spend time in professional offices. Um, Ballybor started with two worlds. Um, I'm very, very appreciative of an event like this. Um, we're trying to do something like that in some of the offices in our city, but it's an uphill battle. Um, almost like the two cultures, two worlds, two styles of thought, and yet, um, on the surface, it would seem we, we ought to be able to talk with one another. My brief, um, just from a few days ago, was to say something about uh, what Dalibor has now elaborated fully as, as hidden world of architecture. And I, I've been given 10 minutes. <laughs> I'll probably take a little bit less. <laughs> I have, I have, I have, uh, basically one topic and one architect. Uh, imagine yourself given a project and the project like any to be built is built somewhere. What do you do? It's a dimension of architectural work. You survey the place. It's a preliminary to design. When I taught with Dalibor 30 years ago, he told me, David, the, the survey of the site inaugurates the design. I've been reflecting on it for a while and want to give you a case, maybe we can discuss it if it seems sensible, of an architect whose sense of the conditions under which a project is possible indicates what is at stake in what we conventionally and casually call surveying, I take it to be similar to historical understanding. And much of what I want to say arises from a very short piece of writing by Paul Ricoeur called Objectivity and Subjectivity in History. Surveying something distant from one's normal experience, distant in time or in some other place. The architect is um, the one that uh, Dalibor mentioned a Portuguese architect um, whose work I uh, have been looking into since a first visit uh, just several months ago. Uh, his name is Siza. It wasn't something directly visible that first impressed Alvaro Siza when he approached uh, Abbey La Torone uh, in the summer of 2006 having been brought there by a French journalist uh, to design and build uh, a small intervention. Uh, his involvement uh, has been recorded in a series of photographs um, and some comments by CESA, and that's basically what I want to share with you. And if you like, perhaps we could reflect on uh, his uh, apprehension of what was implicit or latent in what could be objectively uh, surveyed. As I said, it wasn't something directly visible that uh, gave him his full and rich sense of the place. Instead, Caesar said, when he moved through the forest, I believe that's important, almost a symbol, um, it was the bells the bells from the, uh, the tower I, I just showed. And then his phrase was interesting. There you see the forest surround and the uh, monastery within. He said that the bells <coughs> opened the entire landscape. Entire, in this sense, I believe has two meanings. It's topographical. His concern from the start was with the building and its wider milieu, the forest, the river, the quarry, but also you'll see on the map I'll show in just a second, the villages, their history. 
the, the bells opened for him, the landscape in its um, extensity and cultural depth. He mentioned Cistercian monasteries throughout Europe. His reflection at the very start took him back to Lisbon, a city that was once surrounded by a forest. And he regretted the loss of the forest. The place, Provence, brought him to Paul Cezanne and to Pablo Picasso. The history to which he referred with this phrase, opening the landscape, not through something that was directly seen, but in this case heard, uh, was the history of the institution, but also his personal history as Portuguese, as an architect, person interested in modern culture. My opening observation, I suppose, is that when uh, something is seen uh, directly, uh, something implicit also uh, begins to make sense. So as he approached uh, Torone, hadn't seen it yet, what was on his mind, uh, what he brought to the place, and <coughs> almost the lens through which the survey was uh, constructed, were the, uh, in particular, the landscapes of, of Paul Cezanne. You can see that when he arrived uh, to the building, he was given a, a really dumb, yeah, I think the word he used was stupid, tourist map. Mm -hmm. He has it in his uh, left hand, and he drew at this time, uh, as some of us once did, with a big pen. And uh, the first walkthrough, he said he occasionally looked at the map, but thought he should continue his wander, the wander that had taken him through the woods, through the uh, institution. And uh, in the course of um, walking the space, he made annotations on the plan. Please look at it and look at what he's added. A survey which is a focus and an augmentation to what has been documented objectively. Uh, purposes that had been neglected in the tourist survey are added because of his knowledge of Cistercian institutions. Mm -hmm. More interesting still is the fact that he went beyond to nearby villages. They seem to bear on the identity of the place and likewise, um, characteristics of the terrain. What did he map? Well, uh, his own path, the levels, the prospects, the path of the sun and of the wind, views, as well as uh, the uh, geometry of the institution, which in one very beautiful phrase, he simply defined as communal life under the rule. But the rule in this sense is the hours, and the hours he tried to indicate with uh, the path, path of the sun. After the preliminary walkthrough, he uh, retreated from the place in its fullness, retreated into his own reconstruction of what he had just seen without a measuring stick, with his paces, the effort, the ease of climbing and descending a hill, the distances, the proximities, the associations, and constructed his own plan. It's an interesting drawing. Mm. I think it's, you might even say it's a beautiful drawing for what it shows and what it discloses as the content implicit in the place that hadn't been revealed in either the objective survey or what could be observed in direct visibility. <coughs> That's the subject matter of, uh, of surveying. The term he used is an interesting one. When it gets Englished, it's approximately this, rectification. <laughs> the plan was correct, but it had mm. to be corrected. Mm. Mm. Vis a vis what? Vis a vis what? How do you correct a correct plan? To what do you refer? These are his rectifications. For me, it's a very beautiful, beautiful enigma. And then he said, when I survey, it's pointless to show everything. There's a difference between a novel and a phone book. A fool can measure all the details, but an architect intent on a project 
finds those are salient to the interests that bring you to the site. So when you visit the site, I'm saying, the objective survey you've been given that any tourist could read first needs to be rectified according to the depth of the situation and secondly needs to be uh, augmented maybe even again corrected for a second time with respect to the intentions of the project. This is where Recur says there is a necessary subjectivity in every history. He calls it a limited subjectivity, <coughs> without which it's not a story, but a <coughs> collection of facts. I don't think that's what architects do when they visit places. If I put it a little bit more aggressively, probably incorrectly, I would say that what was given was constructed. I, I suspect I'll be criticized for that um, phrasing. The elements that are so striking about the place turned Caesar to the conditions under which they were possible. How did you get the lava bowl where the, where the monks prepare for the meal? Well, you, if you've been to the site, you know that it was watered by a fairly good-sized river. And before the monastery was constructed, the river was diverted. And the diversion was at the lower level of the slope and initially passed into the lava bowl, clean water, clean hands, and then further along, this diversion passed beneath the latrines. To have a latrine and a lava bowl, you need a river. To understand the elements of the place, you need to get beyond or into the depth of what is um, palpably, visibly, obviously apparent. So to have a chapter room. Ah, Caesar said, before there was this beautiful stone, some say hard and bright as diamonds, there's the quarry, there's the hill, and there's the quarrying and the agriculture in the background of the refectory and the stone walls, just as there is a library behind the cha chapter room. So Caesar found himself migrating beyond the object into its let's say, constitutive field. So uh, the refectory, what does it presuppose? What practices of viticulture and the relationship between the work and the service in the institution, those are the topics that enter into his study. I have a quotation. I'll close with three quotations uh, from Caesar, which I found remarkably beautiful. On the matter of his drawings, this is not Torone. This is, um, as I'm sure you can tell, one of the early, early drawings for the, the, uh, the swimming pools. His, his basically his first building although he did one for his parents. I decided not to show you that. Uh, Caesar says this. Um, if, I, if you write anything down from what I say, write this down. Not me, Caesar. All gestures, including the gesture of drawing, are laden with history, some of which is unconscious. Memory has, he then says, incalculable wisdom. And that seems in, his, in, Caesar's, in Caesar's hand. The habituation of marking, the configurations, the dimensionings, all of that is constituted, if you will, personally, but those forms and that, those configurations, they have a history to which these marks uh, refer in a broader, I suppose one could say, uh, cultural sense. And. Uh, and the, the second attribute of these sketches that he pointed to um, is their partiality. It's not the whole of the site that surveys document. It's parts. And it's as if the part gives rise to a completion or opens itself to appropriation by virtue of its partiality. I say this because in the drawings that architects do in my part of the world, probably here too, 
It's just the opposite. It's the completeness, the fullness. BIM drawings put more of a building together than we'd ever seen before. Caesar says just the reverse prompts creative work. Those vestiges, those mnemonic devices, give rise to new possibilities, I think partly because they're incomplete and yet indicative. The marks of the drawing, the survey, are incomplete indications of a possible project, is what I mean to say with uh, Siza. He uh, reflected on his work in Portugal as opposed to the projects he built in both Holland and Germany. Uh, I've noticed there aren't many catalogs of architectural products in this office. In uh, U.S. In, in Philadelphia offices, you often pass through a library not like this, but of elements in the, in the sense that Dalibor introduced. Mm -hmm. He said that he found it almost impossible to work in that surplus mm -hmm. because you were only limited by cost, but cost is the last consideration in the development of the project according to the preliminaries mm -hmm. I've set out. He said, I'm quoting, uh, when choices are multiple, limited only by cost, then experience and memory have no role to play. Uh, the last thing I'll, I'll end with, um, here you see what I take to be a remarkably beautiful drawing arising out of the preliminary documents at the water's edge. Uh, uh, it's a phrase from him that I I wanted to begin and end with. He wrote, uh, what is yet to come hides within what is now. History is what we have been through, are in the midst of, and is yet incomplete. So he says, I'm quoting, construction goes with life. Things come down and replace others, but an invisible continuity exists. In some places, the Preconditions are clear. He mentioned Piazza Navona. Where did that come from? But well, one can guess the circus. In other cases, less so. But nonetheless, here I'm quoting again, there is always continuity, comma, more or less violent. And to summarize uh, what I've tried to say about what is implicit in what we see and good drawing makes legible, uh, is the following passage. Uh, architecture is a revelation of the hazily latent collective desire. This cannot be taught, but it is possible to learn to desire it. <laughs>